Christian Society, just to give you some background on that. And then we're going to go into some species that you can see right here off our coast. Uh, when we get into talking about those, there's over 80 different species of cetaceans around the world. Some of the species that we have here are found in other parts of the world. Um, there's some variations in them. So don't think that, uh, you know, what we're concentrating on tonight is just a very small part. It's just what you can see here. So the American Cetacean Society is the oldest whale conservation organization in the world. Uh, and they were founded in 1967. Pull the mic down. Now, why don't you pull the mic down, Joy? And just pull that. I think that's okay. Will be okay. All right. Okay. And so um, the Oregon chapter was just founded two years ago. Uh, they have the American Cetacean Society has chapters. Um, in various locations around the United States. They have members from countries around the world. And the Oregon um, was left out. We didn't have a chapter. And so I decided, well, it was time we had one because we've got great whales here. So... <clears throat> The mission of the American Cetacean Society is to protect whales, dolphins, and porpoises. That's what cetaceans are, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and their habitats. Um, we do public education, research grants, and conservation. So uh, the chapters and the national organization give out grants to students. Uh, we also do programs like this for public education. We give presentations at schools, uh, in the community, we do whale watches, things like that to help educate people. And then conservation actions, we participate in beach cleanups um, and policy making, those types of things. <coughs> marine environment, um, some of the most productive areas in the world, and so that supports a great diversity of marine life, including cetaceans, and so it's just right here for us. Uh, we're going to talk about 12 different species tonight. We're not going to go into the beaked whales, but just know that we also have beaked whales here off our coast as well. Beaked whales are not very well studied and not a lot known about them, uh, but <clears throat> we do have them here. It's just not one that we're going to talk about today. And this goes into the vision of the American Cetacean Society and one of the important things to highlight here is about um, both marine and riverine habitats. <coughs> so the watershed, how important that is to our whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So when we have visitors here to the Oregon coast, uh, letting people know that even if they've come from the Midwest, there's things that they can do to help whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And that's taking care of the watershed wherever they live. So that's one of the um, things that the American Cetacean Society does is um, trying to work together for the whole ecosystem. So some of the things that the American Cetacean Society 
did um, the commercial moratorium on whaling. Um, they were very instrumental in that. One of the other things that they do is whale watching, which has um, become an increasing industry, um, economic uh, effects. And one of my favorite quotes is by Sylvia Earle, and she says, you have to come to love it before you are moved to save it. Getting people out to see whales, dolphins, and porpoises gets them interested in wanting to know what they can do for these amazing creatures. Another program that the ACS has is the Viva Vaquita program. The Vaquita is the world's most endangered marine mammal at this point in time. There's only about 200 of these animals left. They are a very small porpoise, and they're found in a very limited range. You can see there the, the triangle. They are in the Gulf of California, what formerly was called the Sea of Cortez. They have a very pristine environment there, but the problem is the shrimp fisheries. Because this porpoise is only five feet long, five to six feet, it gets easily entangled in the nets. And so one of the projects um, has been to save this endangered porpoise. The government of Mexico and the United States have worked together and they have developed some nets that will allow the shrimp fishery to continue but have an escape hatch for the vaquita to be able to get free. They are working on getting these into the hands of the fishermen. The Mexican government has also given money to fishermen who are interested in, in starting some other form of business <coughs> and wanting to leave the fishing industry in order to help save the vaquita. So that's one of the projects that the American Cetacean Society works on.
curriculum guide for teachers that they can download for free from the website. There are fact sheets on various species that you can download, lots of educational information. And we have a scientific review board and they're the ones that um, review all this information before it's published so that you know that you're getting accurate information. And then we have two publications. The Whale Watcher Journal comes out once a year and there are some examples on the table over there that you can look at afterwards. They are guest edited by a scientist in the field. Usually they're about a particular species, although we've had some on certain topics like climate change. Uh, and then all the articles are written by active researchers working with that particular species. The spy hopper talks a lot about issues currently affecting cetaceans. That comes out four times a year and it's available free on the website. You can just go to the website and read those. Tongue, 
symmetrical skull, and as far as we know, they don't do echolocation. They do, however, communicate, um, and they do make sounds, it's just not echolocation. Then we have the odontocetes. Those are toothed whales, and that's where dolphins and porpoises fall in. They have teeth, they have a single blowhole, <coughs> A small tongue, the males are larger, their skull is asymmetrical, and they use echolocation. And over here on this table, we have um, some samples of, and as I go through, Thomas will help hold up some of the things um, to show you. Afterwards, if you want to come up and take a closer look at them and you touch it, feel free to do so. Uh, <clears throat> to dolphins and porpoises, there's a couple of differences. The dolphins usually, and this is always a, a generalization, so usually have a curved or hooked dorsal fin. They have a beak, and they have cone or pointed teeth. And there <coughs> is a dolphin lower jaw over there on the table. And you can feel those teeth. They are sharp. There's also some harbor porpoise teeth over there. Um, and you'll see, when you look at the harbor porpoise teeth, there's a part that's sort of curved. That's the part that's down in the gum. The flat, spade-shaped piece is the part that's sticking up. Uh, the dolphins are usually long and sleek, friendly. They're the ones that like to play with the boats usually found in larger schools and ponds, whereas porpoises tend to be more reclusive, small groups, sometimes you'll just see one or maybe four or five. They're usually short and stout, you don't have a beak, and their dorsal fin is usually a triangular shape. These are the species that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the minke whale, the gray whale, most people are familiar with the gray whale. Um, humpbacks, we also <coughs> have thin and blue whales. All of those are baleen whales. Then we've got the sperm whale, which is a toothed whale. The orca or killer whale, which is actually a large dolphin. Uh, Pacific white-sided Riso and northern right whale dolphins, and then we have the harbor porpoise and the doll's porpoise. <coughs> so we'll start out with the humpback whale. Uh, the humpback whale is usually 40 to 50 feet long and 40 tons, about 80,000 pounds. It has a 12 foot tall below that's kind of bushy. It has a large head with tubercles and typically it is black on the top and lighter colored below. The dorsal fin is short and stubby and about two-thirds of the way back, and you can see that in the top picture up there. One of the things that distinguishes the humpback is the long white pectoral flippers. They're 15 feet long. They're black on top and white underneath in this part of the world. Uh, they're very acrobatic, breaching, peck slapping, lobtailing, spy hopping, so that's one of the ways to recognize the humpbacks. So when you're out whale watching, there's a couple things you're going to look for. First of all, you usually look for the blow. Um, also look for a disturbance in the water. When you see a disturbance in the water, uh, oftentimes that's porpoises, dolphins, or humpbacks make quite a disturbance in the water. Um, the way that they 
ID the humpback whales is through the underside of their tail flukes. So it's like a fingerprint, it's unique. And there are places um, that are in charge of cataloging whales, and they keep these photo ID catalogs. And uh, so Cascadia Research Collective up in Washington is one place that, that does those. And so uh, you can get the catalog and you can take a look at your picture and you can try and figure out which whale it was you saw. It's very difficult to do. <laughs> um, usually humpbacks are found either singly or in small groups. When they're on their feeding grounds, then they will be in large groups. They usually feed on krill and small fish like herring and anchovies. They do lunge feeding, but they also do something unique, which is the bubble neck feeding. And that's where a group of whales will swim in an upward spiral, and they release a stream of bubbles from their blowhole. And it makes the fish move up to the surface, and then they come up and just scoop up the fish. So uh, these humpback whales are very vocal. They're nicknamed the singing whales. They do long, complex songs, 15 to 20 minutes long, and they repeat it over and over again for hours at a time. The males are the ones that do the singing, and each population sings the same song each year. But then the following year, it changes just slightly, and gradually over time, year by year, it, it, it changes. But each population keeps to their own song. Uh -huh. They're not sure why they do this thing. They think it may have something to do with mating, but not necessarily. So there's a, a migration on humpback whales that go from Alaska to Hawaii. That's where the majority of the humpbacks are found. There is also a population that migrates from Alaska down to Mexico, following the same route as the gray whale. The total population of humpbacks <coughs> is about six to 7,000, and about 20% or 1,200 of them are ones that follow along our coast and head to Mexico and back. They um, have a lifespan of at least 50 years, they're slow swimmers. Um, they'll do five to 10 blows and then a deep dive where they might be down 10 to 20 minutes. In the summer when they're here feeding, you'll see them here off our coast feeding, then their dives are shorter, three to five minutes they're down while they're feeding. They usually reach sexual maturity around six to 10 years old, and they give birth to a calf every two to three years. Um, their gestation is 12 months. Their calves are 10 to 15 feet when they're born in about 2,000 pounds. Their milk is very, very fatty, 45 to 60 percent fat content. And then they'll wean somewhere between one and two years. Now, one of the reasons, and this applies to all the baby wean whales, that their milk is um, so rich is when you look at the baby wean, if they had thin milk, human milk is about 2% fat, um, it would run right through. Instead, what comes out are big blobs of this fat that the baby can then lick off the baleen with its tongue. Otherwise, it would just run right into that baleen. Mm -hmm. uh, so humpbacks are still considered a threatened and endangered species. They've had a very slow recovery from whaling, and they also have problems with entanglement, uh, long pectoral flippers get tangled up, 
Um, so that's the issues of concern with the humpbacks. Humpbacks are really fun to watch. Um, you'll see quite a bit of activity when you see them doing their peck spotting and, and breaching. So these are the ones that the top picture up there shows you some breaching that are you know, most well known for that kind of activity. whether it's a fin whale or a blue whale. More than likely, it's a fin whale because the population of fin whales is much greater than our population of blue whales. Uh, it is a roar call, which means it has these beats or grooves in its throat. It runs from its lower jaw clear down to its navel, and it allows it to expand to take in food. So the fin whale is very long and sleek and streamlined and fast. It's called the greyhound of the sea. It can go 23 miles an hour. It very rarely flukes. Uh, there was one that was tagged near Iceland, traveled 181 miles in one day. So these guys can move. <laughs> It has a hooked or curved dorsal fin that's three quarters of the way down its back. They're usually alone or in small groups, maybe three to seven animals. And that's pretty typical of baleen whales. Baleen whales tend to be solitary or very small groups. They don't have the social interaction that the toothed whales and dolphins and porpoises do. Fin whales make very loud, low-frequency vocalizations that travel hundreds of miles through the sea. The population estimates for the North American Pacific is anywhere from 14 to 20,000. So that's why you're more likely, when you're looking, it's more than likely a fin whale that you're seeing. They have a unique coloration on their lower jaw, the white, oops, <laughs> the white side, the right side is white and black on the left. They have 260 to 480 baleen plates on each side of the mouth. So when you see the baleen, I don't have fin whale baleen up here, but when you look at the other, um, <coughs> That's a lot of plates of baleen to be hanging down. It's up to 30 inches long and 12 inches wide. And they feed on krill, on small schooling fish like herring, capelin, sand lance. They're lunge feeders, so they swim in and scoop up all this fish, up to two tons of food a day. And the fin whale can live to be at least 80 years old. So quite a long time. Uh, they reach sexual maturity at six to ten years of age. Uh, their gestation is 12 months. They have a calf every three to four years, and they nurse for six to eight months. Uh, at birth, they're 14 to 21 feet and two to three tons. So that's a big baby. <laughs>
yellowish gray. And this one shows uh, this picture where you can see those throat grooves that all the norkel whales have. Um, they also have the really tall blow, 20 to 40 feet. They're very streamlined and their dorsal fin is very small relative to their body size and it's set really far back. It's only one foot tall and it's three quarters of the way back. So when you see a blue whale, you see back, 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 and then finally this little tiny dorsal fin. They also have this large splash guard in front of their blow holes. Um, their tail flukes are crescent shaped and kind of slim, especially when you look at the size of that whale, how small those tail flukes are. Um, they do not breach. They're found offshore, again, alone or in small groups, as a typical baleen whale. They were called sulfur bottoms, and that's because they get a yellowish cast on the underside where their skin is coated with diatoms, which is a very small phytoplankton. Um, and so in the old days, whalers called them sulfur bottoms. Their baleen is black. They have 260 to 400 plates on each side of the upper jaw. So they can have up to 800 plates there. It's 20 to 40 inches long. They feed on krill, and they do both gulping and lunge feeding. They have to eat four tons a day, which is 40 million krill a day. So the largest animals in the world eat the tiniest food in the world. <laughs> they're fast, strong swimmers. When they're cruising along, they go about 12 miles an hour, but they can do bursts up to 30 miles an hour. They do these low frequency uh, sounds that are deep and rumbling. You can feel them more than hear them. Um, they have the loudest voice in the animal kingdom. It travels hundreds of miles. And they're not sure why the blue whales make these noises, whether it's for communication, whether it's for navigation or orientation, whether they're uh, bouncing sounds off the ski mounts to, to help them travel. So, uh, <clears throat> but they're the loudest. So they, the blue whale, you know, sets a couple records here, being the largest animal and the loudest animal. <laughs> they reach sexual maturity when the males reach about 74 feet and the females 79 feet. Again, their gestation is about 11 to 12 months, and they give birth to a calf every two to three years. At birth, their calves are 23 to 27 feet and 6,000 pounds. They nurse for six to eight months, and during that nursing period, the calf consumes 100 gallons of milk a day and gains 200 pounds a day. Basically, eight pounds an hour. And they grow an inch and a half every day. The population estimates here for blue whales are 1,500 to 3,000. That's why it's much more likely that what you're seeing is a fin whale, with the population being close to 20,000. But we have had blue whales, even though they're typically offshore, we have had blue whales come in within five miles of shore. So it, it does happen in several years in a row we've had blue whales come in close. Um, their lifespan is about 70 years. Whaling kills about 99% of the population of blue whales around the world. And it has been an extremely slow recovery. One of the things is with these whales, they have a long gestation period, they have a long period of nursing, 
their calving is every you know three years or some species longer. So they're not reproducing as, as often, and so it's taking longer for them to rebound. So in general, animals do one of two things. Either they will have a lot of offspring, they'll lay a lot of eggs with the hopes that a few are going to survive and they'll put a lot of effort into taking care of those eggs. Or they'll give birth to one offspring and spend a lot of time tending to it, caring for it. Um, and so the cetaceans fall into that category. It's very, very rare to have a twin birth. <coughs> there have been a couple recorded, and um, usually they do not both survive. So, all right.
conical teeth you can see in that one picture up there. They're three to eight inches long. They're found only in the lower jaw. There's 40 to 50 teeth. And then in the upper jaw, they have this series of sockets, and the lower teeth fit into that. Uh, their flukes are broad, 16 feet from tip to tip. The threats to the sperm whale are typically ship strikes, because they're further offshore, um, and entanglements. And uh, <clears throat> with the sperm whales, because um, they have, have such long calving intervals, they also are very slow to recover. Sex 
sexual maturity at 15 to 20 years, females 13 to 15 years. And the females go through a menopause in their mid-40s. So they don't have a long time for them to uh, rear children. They only have every three to five years. So each mother doesn't give birth to very many. Their gestation is about 17 months. Their calves are six to eight feet long and 300 to 400 pounds, and they nurse for one to two years. Their milk is about 50% fat. Now, one of the problems, particularly for the southern resident killer whales, is that um, because they're the top predator, they tend to bioaccumulate a lot of toxins. The PCBs, DDT, those things which, even though we banned them years ago, these animals still carry. So typically, the mother, the female, will offload the toxins in her milk. And so usually her firstborn offspring does not survive due to the toxin levels in her milk. That's also why the males have a much shorter lifespan. The males only live 50 years, the females 80 years, because the males don't have a way of offloading that through the milk. Um, the uh, males, when they're about 13, they do what's called sprouting. That's when their dorsal fin starts to grow. So up until that time, the young males have this smaller dorsal fin like the females. That dorsal fin is made up of connective tissue, and they'll go through this growth spurt, and then their dorsal fin will sprout. One of the ways that you photo ID the uh, killer whales is by their dorsal fins and by their saddle patch, which is the area that's markings right behind the dorsal fin. There are catalogs of uh, all the southern <coughs> residents. They've also cataloged a lot of the bigs or transients. So last summer, I saw one that we sent in a photo and they were able to ID. And it was U039, it's a transient or big bull. And what they were able to tell me was it has not been seen very often. Um, the encounters that they have of it on record have been seen around Vancouver Island. But it's really one that they don't know a whole lot about. So, um, the estimates for the population, southern residents are down to about 80. Mm -hmm. So they have lost several in the last few years and have not had significant births. Um, so they're really um, focused on as an endangered species. The northern residents, which are found British Columbia area, uh, north of where the southern residents are, they number about 258,000 in 2009. Um, the bigs, or the transients, estimates, these are just estimates, probably greater than 250. The offshores, which they don't really know a whole lot about, but they've cataloged over 300 of those in British Columbia. So, um, we are going to be bringing a speaker, Eric Hoyt. He has researched orcas for 40 years plus, and he's coming on Saturday, May 10th. We're having an event at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. He's going to be. He's going to come and be our featured speaker. He's going to talk about his very first beginnings with a pod up in British Columbia to what he's now doing, which are the uh, orcas off of Russia. And he has ID <coughs> three all white orcas um, off of Russia. 
So uh, it's going to be at the Oregon Coast Aquarium on May 10th. Uh, there's information on the poster over there. You can buy tickets ahead of time online at $5 a person. Hear him speak. Yes. I read several years ago the main orca that comes from Norwegian, and that killer whale is a mistranslation. The original word meant whale killer. Right. Killer of whales, whale killer. Um, and it depends on who you talk to, which name they prefer to use. Currently, scientists are pre preferring to use the name killer whale. Um, it, it comes and goes in favor. And orca, when you look at the origins of the word orca, it's um, not much better than killer whale. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them do. So the bigs or transients do. And they will take usually gray whale caps. They'll take minky whales. They have been known to attack humpbacks. They have been known to try and take a blue whale, which, yeah, <laughs> that's ambitious. Typically, they'll come together to hunt cooperatively. One of the things when we get to gray whales in the presentation, that's one of the ways that we um, ID gray whales is by killer whale tooth rakes on them. So you'll see that on, on the gray whales for the ones that have managed to escape. But it's all part of the food web and everything has to eat. There is a bit of a myth about the fact that killer whales will just take the tongue of the gray whale. And that's not been found to be the case. Um, John Ford and Graham Ellis did some research and found that what they will do when they take a gray whale calf, they'll feed on it. They'll move it to an area of about 30 feet of water and then they will leave it there and they will come back to feed on it for the next five days or so. Then after that point, they've had what they want of it. It goes on and becomes food for everything else. So. <laughs> okay, Pacific white-sided dolphins, also known as lags. Um, that's short for their scientific name there. They're about 7 to 8 feet long and 200 to 300 pounds. They live about 40 to 45 years. They feed on squid and small schooling fish, herring, anchovies, sardines, capelin. Their predators are killer whales. This is one of the things that the transients or bigs will go after. We are more likely to see them May through October here. Then they shift south to California, November to April, they're down there, frequently seen in California. Um, that's due to the water temperature. Here, they're usually further offshore. In California, they're very close to shore. They are in groups of 10 to 50, can be hundreds to 1,000. These are very acrobatic. They breach, they're curious, lots of splashing around. They like to um, bow ride and wake ride. And they swim fast, um, 15 knots. They dive when they're down for three to seven minutes. You will often find them with other dolphins. Um, they'll often be with pinnipeds, which are seals and sea lions, and seabirds. You'll see a lot of seabirds around them, too. They have this large, sharply curved dorsal fin at the center of their back, and there's a good picture of it in these two on the left-hand side. 
Their um, sexual maturity occurs when they're about six feet long. The age of that varies. Their gestation is anywhere from nine to 12 months, and their calves are about three feet. And they usually nurse for at least six months. The population estimates are unknown. There's a huge range depending on what resource you look at, anywhere from 30,000 to more than 100,000. Uh, so quite variable there, and I think really basically <coughs> unknown. Um, but these are uh, very fun, and you can see on the bottom picture here where they do that rooster tail spray. And we'll be getting into that here with um, some of the other dolphins and porpoises that do that. Is that a beak? This right here, uh -huh. yes, that's their beak right here. Now, the Risos is called the gray dolphin. Um, it's usually eight and a half to 12 and a half feet, average about 10 feet, and they weigh about 650 pounds. They can be up to 1,100 pounds. They have that very blunt head and a grayish or silverish body with this extensive scarring. The scarring, they're not sure about, whether it's others, Riso's dolphins biting them, whether it's squid bites, since they feed on squid, or whether it's parasites. Um, they've got a tall, curved dorsal fin in the middle of their back. You can see that in the lower picture there. They're an offshore species, usually 10 to 20 miles out. So if you're out on a boat, you will run into Riso's here. Usually groups of three to 40, on occasion 100 to 3,000. They are frequently seen with Pacific white-sided dolphins and northern right whale dolphins. So they like to hang out together. They feed at night since they feed on squid. They're very inquisitive and active. They tail slap and breach and spy hop. Not much is known about their reproduction. They guess their sexual maturity at eight and a half to nine feet and gestation 13 to 14 months. Their calves are four to five feet. Um, they live 20 to 40 years. And the population estimate for the West Coast here is about 30,000. Some of their threats are because of their small size, um, they get caught as bycatch um, and get entangled. And the other thing that really affects these are pollution. Um, even though they're, they're offshore, they're not that far out compared to some of the other species. So that's a concern for them. Now the next one is really cool. <laughs> The northern right whale dolphin. Um, these have no dorsal fin. They are eel like, very long and slender, slim tail stalk, very sleek looking. Um, they're about 8 to 10 feet, and males weigh about 240 pounds. They live about 42 years. They feed on squid and lantern fish. So again, they're um, ones that typically feed at night. They uh, associate with the Pacific white-sided dolphins. They're in large pods of 100 plus and um, very active, fast swimmers, 20 miles an hour. They do these, and you can see it there in the top and bottom picture on that side, low angle leaps. It's similar to what sea lions do. So they'll look similar to sea lions going through the water. They also do um, belly flops, tail slapping, reaching. They, they like to ride um, in, in the wake and bow ride. So they have some seasonal shifts. Um, inshore, offshore, north, south. 
they think it's related to their prey availability. Here, they're typically found offshore. Their calving is usually in July and August, and they have every two years, their gestation period's about a year. Their estimate on population is about 14,000 on the west coast. But they're, um, these are ones that typically, if they're mistaken um, in identifying, people mistake them for a pinniped, not for a other type of filter. Harbor porpoise, and you'll see these right here from shore. Five to six feet long, 130 to 160 pounds, but they don't have a very long lifespan, 13 to 24 years. Um, they're usually within six miles of shore in shallow water, and their blow is like a sneezing sound. It's a short puffing blow, and a lot of times you'll hear them, not necessarily see them, and you'll hear what sounds like a sneeze. Uh, they're, they feed on schooling fish and squid, and their predators are killer whales and large sharks. These ones are very shy. They're usually seen alone or in small groups, no more than usually five or six. They're not exuberant. They don't fluke, they don't leap. Um, you'll, you'll see oftentimes just the dorsal fin popping <laughs> through the water. They have a very robust body and small round head. The dorsal fin, as you can see in that top picture, very small, low, triangular. Uh, they're, they have a dark gray back, and then it progresses to lighter gray on the sides down to white on their belly. They um, reproduce every three to four years. Their calves are 27 to 35 inches, 11 to 22 pounds, so they're small. Um, their gestation is about 11 months, and they nurse till they're about eight months old. Their population size is unknown, but they do know it has been declining since the 1950s. Um, there's a couple factors, pollution, entanglement in fishing gear, and habitat loss. Because they're a coastal, close to shore species, um, as we encroach upon the habitat, that affects them. Also, because of their small size, five to six feet, it's easy for them to get entangled. Dolls porpoise. So a lot of times um, people will mistake this one for a baby orca um, because of the black and white color. It's a black and white porpoise, six to seven and a half feet. It's found near shore and offshore. A lot of times here in Oregon, within five miles of shore. So something you can see when you're doing land-based whale watching, as well as out on the boat. Um, pods of two to 20, when they're feeding, you can have groups of 200. Um, they're robust. They're the fastest swimmer of the smaller cetaceans, 35 miles an hour. They dart, they zigzag, they love to uh, ride in the wake and the bow of the boat. So, uh, and they, they're they very, very fun, and you just see them zipping and darting. <coughs> they have uh, the rooster tail, which is this distinctive spray pattern. You can see it in some of the pictures up there. What it does is it creates this hollow cone of an air pocket, and that way they can still breathe while they're under the surface of the water. That's how they get that speed. They don't have to surface all the
away because they've got this little pocket of air that they form there. And that's what that rooster tail is. They also have eye color. Most cetaceans do not have eye color. Gulls porpoises have this black or dark blue iris and then a deep iridescent blue-green pupil. So that's one of the things that makes them unique, as well as being the fastest swimmer. Uh, <clears throat> they feed on squid, small schooling fish, and they'll also feed on deep water fish. So hake, lantern fish, they'll feed at night. They eat 28 to 30 pounds of food each day. And they have a thinner blubber layer than the other cetaceans. And that means they have to have a really high metabolic rate to keep them warm. So that's why they need to eat so much food each day, even though they're a small size cetacean. They reach sexual maturity at seven to eight years old. They, the dolls porpoise, some of them will have a calf every year. Um, up to every three years. And their gestation is 10 to 12 months. And their calves are three and a half feet, 24 to 50 pounds. There are reports of hybrids. The doll's porpoise and the harbor porpoise will breed. And that has happened both in captivity and in the wild. Um, there's about 50,000 dolls porpoise in the area of California, Oregon, and Washington. They um, tend to get caught in the drift gill nets um, and be caught as bycatch. Their lifespan is about 15 years or less. Now, um, in Japan, the dolls porpoise is one of the cetaceans that they And their quota is about 18,000 dolls porpoise a year. Their population in their waters is over 100,000. So they have a larger uh, population than we do, but that is one of the ones that they, they still are hunting. And like I said, this one's often mistaken as a baby orca, and the Marine Mammal Stranding Network will get calls about, you know, and the minke whale. So this is the smallest baleen whale, 23 to 30 feet, 10 tons. Minke whales are here in the same area as gray whales. They're very hard to see because they have a very small fine blow. Okay. Uh, it's six to 10 feet, but it blows over really, really quick. And so more often you hear them than see the blow, you'll hear the blow. They have a sickle-shaped dorsal fin that's two thirds of the way back, a very sharply pointed rostrum. So the rostrum is the front part of the whale there, and you see in the bottom picture, you can see that pointy snout. Um, they're dark gray with a white belly. And when they um, come up, their blowhole and their dorsal fin will be visible simultaneously. So that's one of the ways of IDing the minky whale. It doesn't usually fluke. And the minky whales that we have here in this part of the world have a white pectoral band. So on their flipper, their pectoral flipper, they'll have a white band. They're usually solitary, um, sometimes pairs, small groups, four to six. And they feed on small schooling fish, herring, sand lance, capelin. They lunch feed. But they also like to steal fish from seabirds. So what they'll do is you'll see them come up and the birds will be there with the bait ball of fish. And they'll come up right through the middle and the birds will scatter and they will steal the fish. <laughs> uh, they're a fast swimmer, eight 
18 to 24 miles an hour. They're found inshore and offshore. Oftentimes they're seen inshore here. Um, and a lot of times they'll just suddenly surface next to the boat and uh, just seem to come out of nowhere. They have a cream-colored bay mane, and they have 230 to 360 plates on each side, but their bay mane is very short. Of course, they're also a much smaller whale. They're the smallest bay mane whale. It's 11 to 12 inches long. They are a whirlpool, so they do have the grooves. They have 50 to 70 plates or grooves. You can see it in that bottom picture down there. They reach sexual maturity at seven to eight years and they do their breeding in the summer. Their gestation is 10 to 11 months, so a little bit shorter. Um, they calve every other year and they nurse for about six months. Their calves are nine to 10 feet long. The population estimates for a stock that covers California, Oregon, and Washington is 619 whales. Uh, Jonathan Stern at San Francisco uh, State University studies minke whales and catalogs them. And um, so that's his estimate for how many are in this range. They are estimated to live about 50 years and their predator is the base or transient orca. Orcas do like minke whales because they're a small whale. And then last but not least, the gray whale, everybody's favorite. <laughs> so the gray whale's 40 to 50 feet. We like to tell people about the size of a school bus, um, 30 to 40 tons. They're below 6 to 12 feet high, and they expel 400 liters of air in a single blow. They have no dorsal fin. They have six to 12 knuckles behind a dorsal hump. Knuckles, that's what they call them. Um, so it's a, it's a set of bumps behind the, the dorsal hump. Their tail flukes are nine to 12 feet from tip to tip. They have the longest migration of any mammal, 12,000 miles round trip. And one of the things we haven't talked about yet that we have over here on the table are about barnacles and whale lice. So there is a barnacle that's unique to the gray whale. Um, they have about 200 pounds of barnacles on them. Barnacles do not hurt the whale, but they don't help the whale either. Basically, the barnacle is there to catch a free ride for food. So what they do, the barnacles will come along in their uh, larval stage, uh, find a place to settle on the whale. Then they're gonna cement themselves down with a glue that they secrete onto the skin of the whale. They cement themselves down head first. Their feet come out and filter the water. So as the whale is swimming along, they're filtering the water, catching food. A lot of the slower moving whales, which are the baleen whales, will have barnacles. The barnacles are unique to the species of whale. So I've got an example of a gray whale barnacle and I've got an example of humpback barnacles over there. So you'll be able to see the difference between the two. The other thing that they have are whale lice. So unlike human lice, which we try to get rid of, Whale lice are good for the whale. They eat off dead skin cells, keep wounds clean, prevent infection. They have about 200,000 whale lice on them of three different species, two of which are unique to only gray whales. Uh, same type of thing with humpback whales, they have their own uh, whale lice as well. The, um, when they are doing migration, so the migration is from up in the Arctic, they're found in the Chukchi Sea, then 
they head all the way down to the breeding and calving lagoons in Bob. During that migration time and when they're in the lagoons, they are not feeding. So they lose 30% of their body weight during that time. Then they head back north. So breeding and calving lagoons, what happens is first, the pregnant females get there. They're going to give birth. The others are gonna be there to mate, then they're gonna head off. Moms and calves stay behind. The babies are born with a blubber layer, but it is not filled with any fat. So there's no blubber there. They have to fatten up before they can make this trip. They need to gain strength, they need to learn how to swim, they need to, to gain some weight. So usually starting in March, we will see whales and February, March, generally we see them heading northbound. Those are usually pregnant females because they need to go get food. Then we have juveniles and males coming up next, and finally moms and calves. Moms and calves generally don't come until May. Now these are just general. We've seen moms and calves already this year. This year was an early year. We had gray whales coming back north in February. So, you know, it's just a general thing. In usually December and January is when we have them heading southbound. The gray whales are really easy to see from shore because they swim so close to shore, anywhere from one to three miles, um, sometimes five miles out. We also have what's called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. These are about 200 gray whales. They spend their summer and fall here feeding. They are found from Northern California up to British Columbia. And they will be here feeding during that time. They'll be in very close to shore. Sometimes you can stand and just look and they're right here at your feet. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when they're here feeding in the summer, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, they're feeding on a different food source than the ones that continue on to the Arctic. So in the Arctic, they're feeding on amphipods. They're a bottom feeder. They'll also feed, a skim feed on krill and filter feed on small fish. Um, the ones that are found here are usually feeding on mice and shrimp. Now, amphipods live on a muddy bottom. Mice and shrimp live in kelp beds. Kelp is attached to a rocky substrate. So different feeding environment, different food source. We will have them here years when our food source is good. Years when we don't have a good food source, they will continue and move on. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, they also like to filter feed on fish. They can dive to 394 feet and they can stay down up to 30 minutes if they have to. Uh, usually, they're not down that long and usually they're feeding in very shallow water. They can be in water as shallow as 10 feet when they're feeding. And they'll go on their side and people will think it's a shark. Um, we call it sharking. And it's because part of the tail fluke, they've rolled on their side as they've gone down. Part of the tail fluke sticks up and looks like a shark. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> they eat about 2,600 pounds a day during feeding season. And that's because <coughs> during migration and the time they're in the breeding calving lagoons, they are not feeding, so they have to rebuild that. Um, they reach sexual maturity about 5 to 11 years. Their gestation's about a year. Their calf is 15 feet and one ton and they nurse for six to eight months. So usually about August, we see moms and calves separating. Their milk is 
53% fat. Again, they have the baying, it's gotta be that thick, and plus they need to build up that rubber layer. They usually have a calf every two years. They're very slow swimmers, three to five <coughs> miles an hour. Uh, <clears throat> they do um, do what we call fluking, where they throw their tail flukes up. They will spy hop, they will breach. Um, they like to surf in the waves. You'll see them near shore surfing in the waves. Uh, you'll also sometimes see what we call a fluke print. So it's an area of shiny water once they've gone down for a deep dive um, and they've done the fluking behavior, you'll see this patch of shiny water. Their population is estimated to be about 20,000. They live about 50 years. Um, <clears throat> and so typically when you're looking, it's best to look with your naked eye first. Once you've seen the blow, then you can put your binoculars up and focus in. If it's summertime, they'll be close. You might not even need your binoculars to see them. Uh, and, you know, the, the gray whales, um, in the lagoons, there are some, a certain subset that are considered the friendlies. It's about 10% of the population. Um, those ones will approach boats, they'll bring, the moms will bring the calves up. The others generally are not um, friendly, it's not that they're, uh, they just don't pay attention to people. But the one thing to be aware of, a lot of people have uh, gotten this, I think, mistaken idea about these gray whales are friendly and approaching too close. Gray whales at one time were called devil fish by the <coughs> whalers. They, when the whalers, the mothers would attack and destroy whalers' ships. So getting too close to a gray whale is not a good idea and they can do some serious damage <coughs> with their flukes. So one of the things we like to promote is responsible whale watching. Shore-based whale watching is great uh, if you're out in the boat following the guidelines uh, as far as responsible whale watching and keeping their distance. And <coughs> Some of the threats that um, the American Cetacean Society works on, things like predation, which is a, a, a natural uh, phenomenon, but things like habitat loss, whaling, entanglements, ship strikes, pollution, those are all issues that our whales face. I what spy hop means. Spy hop is when they take their head up out of the water Originally it was thought, they come straight up like this, and originally it was thought that it was for them to take a look around, but what they discovered is that over a third of the time, the eye is still submerged underwater. So now they think it may have to do with them coming up to listen to their surroundings. They do have good vision. Um, it's better underwater, but they still have good vision above water, so they could know if the eye is above be taking a look around, but that's not always the case. What are their ears? They, their ears, they don't have any ear flaps. All they have is a little pinhole or an opening. Yeah. Behind the eye? It's behind the eye. Good old Reed 
reduce, reuse, recycle, and the very first word of that is reduce. Um, so, you know, watching what we do as consumers, I always like to say we can vote with our dollars. So what we do and don't buy. Um, and then watching what we put down the drain. And so that's the website for the American Cetacean Society, and it's on cards over there. And like I said, they've got the curriculum, they've got fact sheets, all kinds of things that you can just download for free off their website. Any questions? If their ears are below their eyes, how can they still be surfacing to listen around if their eyes are below the floor? They have very good hearing. And actually, uh, sound travels better in the water. And so they can hear better closer to the water. Uh, that I don't know if closer to the surface makes a difference. But that's their, that's their current theory, anyway. Well, one of your pictures of the gray whale looks like they have white hair. They do. Uh, so, and usually it's the younger whales that will still have the hair. And that's one of the things that uh, helps make mammals mammals is the fact that they have hair. So, particularly the younger whales will have the hair as they get bigger, they tend to lose that. <laughs> Where is it? <coughs> Actually, right here on the front on their rostrum. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, a lot of them will have a little dimple with the hair coming out of it. I'm curious about the symmetric versus asymmetric skulls. It has to do with them being able to echolocate. So the ones that do echolocation have what's called a melon. And so that uh, has to do then with the shape of the skull because they have to have room for that melon in there. It sits sort of um, centered and off. So that's how they send clicks out, and then it bounces back and they receive it, and that's how they find different things through the water. So they have fatty and oil-filled pads in these hollow jaw bones. They send these clicks out and they receive it back. And that tells them where different things are. So that's how they find prey. It's how they find their way around. It's very similar to the sonar that bats use. I think one of the things you didn't mention you on the slide about things that are a danger or risk to cetaceans was the low frequency sonar. Yes. Uh, noise pollution is a, a big thing. 90% of the noise in the ocean is man-made. And hearing is a whale's most highly refined sense. It's used for communication. It's used for echolocation. Sound travels faster in, in water and over a greater distance. So noise pollution is a huge issue for cetaceans. No. Yes. Uh, can I ask you more specifically about your feelings and opinion regarding the U.S. Navy and its extensive sonar testing? Mm -hmm. uh, Captain Paul Watson and Sea Shepherd, mm -hmm. and uh, using orcas at SeaWorld and other places for entertainment. So the American Cetacean Society is working on policies on all of those things. Uh, I, you know, I have my own personal views, but I also represent the American Cetacean Society. So uh, we we actually have uh, policies in the works on captivity issues, 
but those are um, involve a lot of different factors, and so um, there's different pieces to that whole issue. Our policies, what we do is um, the board members do the research and formulate policy, then it goes to our scientific advisory board. We have a panel of scientists who then review every policy before it becomes approved. So right now, those policies are uh, in the works. As far as the Navy sonar issue, at our conference in 2012, we presented both sides of the issue. So we had the NRDC and the attorney present and gave um, their opinion on that. And then we also had someone from the Navy present to present their side of the issue as well. We don't have a policy statement on that, but that is actually one that we voted on at our board meeting in January as one of the next ones to be worked on and brought up. Did any whales get the vote? Just <laughs> 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 